Hey, yo, this is Tall Man Phantasm from that legendary Fella Dwellers crew, and you're now tuned in to Breaking Records Radio. Salute. We're now tuned in to Breaking Records Radio. My name is Alex Kuchma, and I have here with me yet another legend from the 90s New York hip-hop scene. As part of the Cellar Dwellers with his rhyme partner, UG, they drop classic albums like Realms and Reality and The Last Shall Be First. Please welcome to the show, Phantasm. What's good, my man? Yes, sir. Phantasm, tour man, repping that almighty Cellar Dwellers crew. Y'all know what it is. Oh, man, I said this at the beginning of the call here, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day in order to speak to me. I appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. No doubt, no doubt, man. We appreciate all love shown to the group, you know what I mean? 100%. Yeah, you guys dropped some of my favorite shit. Like, the, the sound that you guys came with in the 90s, I think, is is slept on, but I feel like kind of heads of, of underground hip-hop in general um, really kind of admire the, the output that you guys ended up having in the 90s, and even kind of the extended family, if you talk about artists like Rand Reed, and, and just kind of that extended family of Cellar Dwellers, um, I think is, is just highly underrated hip-hop from the 90s. So I'm really excited to be able to kind of talk nitty-gritty details and, uh, and learn something. So yeah, thank no you. Doubt, no doubt. We we never we never no garnered doubt. that commercial success, but sure. through the underground and through you know the backpack era and all of that, we you know we stood the test of time in that in that nature. A hundred percent. So I want to start from the very beginning. Um, how did you end up meeting meeting UG? I met UG from a friend of mine. His name is Gage. We actually did a record called Cranium together, the Cranium remix. Okay, but. Gage was rhyming at the time, and UG was his actual dance. He used to dance for him as a dancer. Oh, wow. So Gage knew that I was, and he had a show one day, and in the limousine going to the show, he introduced me to his dancers, and UG was one of his dancers. And then we had a, a instrumental beat demo, so we asked the limo driver, yo, throw this in, and everybody went in the cypher, and everybody was rhyming. And as UG was rhyming, I was like, yo, you got skills. I don't know if you should be dancing. You should kind of be on stage. He was like, yeah, I'll write my little rap to the side, but I don't know yet. I was like, nah, you, you got the gift. So from there, we exchanged numbers, and, and then we just formed a connection from there. Were you just writing at that period of time, or were you also dancing or doing graph or any other kind of elements uh, incorporated no, I, in hip-hop? I was, I, was, I, was I, was working, I was working on an album as well. I was working on an album, but then okay. once we got together, I said, I'm going to help him with what he was doing. And then things just kind of formed up from there. What happened to those early recording sessions for your album? Did they end up making it onto the, the first Cellar Dwellers project or are they shelved somewhere? They're, they're shelved somewhere. <laughs> and it's, it's some good stuff too. But I want to hear that. Deleted by now, but this was <laughs> talking years and years ago. But yeah, um, yeah I, I, don't even, I don't even have access to any of that stuff. Were you going by Phantasm at that period of time when you were making your, your first no, solo? at that time I was going to Star Child. Star Child, okay. And the, the project that you're working on, um, who's, who's financing that? Is it all yourself or are you kind of partnered with Loud at that period of time or does that all come afterwards? How does, how, what's the kind of logistics behind that first project that you're working on? Oh, that was all just demo stages at that time. It was all just demo, it had a dope producer by the Four name of- Four track um, demos? Uh, no, we was doing we was doing sixteen track demos back then because there was a dope producer in Flatbush at the time. His name was Backspin. He ended up doing work for Leaders of the New School. He did um, Rampage's Wild for the Night. So he got he got a couple okay. of credits. But early on, before he started catching those credits, we were working out some stuff, and we were gonna sign with Wild Pitch, but the offer wasn't big enough. And then you know the connection came with me and UG, and then we started doing that stuff. So. Sure. Jumping a little bit ahead here, but you mentioned Leaders of the New School and Rampage, and I wanted to, to ask about your connection and or relationship, really, with Busta Rhymes, because I, I know that, I don't know of any songs that you guys ended up working together for, but I know that he ended up giving you that shout out on his debut, um, uh, for the, the Death Squad meets Flipsco, uh, Flips, uh, Squad uh, track. Yeah. Um, how, yeah. What was your relationship with, uh, with Busta Rhymes? Uh, me and Busta went, went to school together in elementary school. Wow. Yeah, so we was in the same class, probably about third or fourth grade. You know, he's originally from Flatbush, Brooklyn, where I'm from, before yeah. he moved to Long Island and did the old leaders of the new school thing. So that's that's the connection right there. He's a childhood friend of mine and a good friend. 
Man, that's crazy. I always like, I, I'm in Nova Scotia myself and I grew up in Ontario, but Can Canada anyway. And uh, uh -huh. it's always crazy to me hearing these, uh, these kind of stories from, especially from New York, where it just everyone kind of grew up together and knew each other from growing up. And uh, you start rhyming, you start getting into things, but you have connections with, with everyone just because you kind of grew up in that environment at that period of time. Um, it's just crazy uh -huh. to think like what that environment was even like at that period of time. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, yeah. Brooklyn in, Brooklyn in general is such a big place. Sure. There's so many, there's so many different parts of Brooklyn. So you got Brooklyn where, you know, Jay-Z is from, Biggie is from. They're from the, the Bed-Stuy area. And then you got Brownsville where you got like MOP and Smooth the Hustler in them. And you also got Smith and Wesson and Buckshot and them from another part of Brooklyn. We're from East Flatbush where we got uh, cellar dwellers, Fushnickens, Chub Rock, Special Ed, Little Sean, Rampage. You know what I'm saying? So it's all Crazy of us just in that yeah. one section. So it's yeah. just, it's just every section you go in Brooklyn, there's there's there's, there's talent. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's absolutely phenomenal. Like, um, getting back to I guess the the cellar dwellers kind of. I guess, makeup anyhow. So everywhere you look, of course, you end up seeing Cellar Dwellers build as yourself and, and UG. And, and I get that. That's kind of the core of the group. But in my head, what I think of Cellar Dwellers, I think of that extended family, people like Ren, Reed, and whatnot. But it really kind of pinnacle in my head, I think of Nick Wiz. Um, I wanted to ask about Nick Wiz kind of involvement in the group and how kind of integral you think Nick Wiz was to, to not only Cellar Dwellers, but to the, the sound that you guys ended up providing. Oh yeah, he he was definitely crucial. He was definitely crucial because um, we went to him early for demos just to do some demo work, and he just had this great sound. Yeah, he had this great sound, and and we connected right off the right off the gate. Um, the relationship was organic, and you know guys like Primo and Pete Rock were were charging a lot of money. They were eating up recording budgets with charging fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars for a song. So. Nick Wiz had had that actual same sound for for a cheaper price. So once we got with him, we kind of didn't look anywhere else. We 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 found our little niche, and we we just yeah. we just stuck with him, and it, and it worked. It clicked. Yeah, it's the same type of sound, but it quality wise, I think it, it keeps up to to par with uh, I think a lot of the, the oh, rates, right? With, with, your with your Pete Rock, Lord with, Professor, etc. Yeah, anybody at that time, Lord Professor, you know, Diamond D. All the, you know, the digging in the creek. Ooh, Nick Wiz, his sound was right there with everybody. So we we didn't we didn't have to go anywhere else to be honest. Yeah, I I heard that you and this is kind of a funny story here, but I I hope that you're able to kind of uh, illuminate it a little bit more. But I heard that you and some others on Loud Records had a paintball match in in 1995. Uh, can did. you can you elaborate on that paintball match with? And I heard it was it was Wu Tang's uh, Ghostface Killer and Rape One Mob Deep. And then yourself mm -hmm. and, and UG. Um, can you tell me what the story really is? With this and and, and alcoholics was there too. Shit, I didn't know that at all. Yeah, it was, the alcoholics was there. Yeah, the alcoholics was there too. Um, yeah, we had this war games going on, and that, at that time everybody was was into you know shooting and the camouflage, and and we had this war game with the different yeah. groups, and everybody we, we teamed up half this way, half that way, and we were getting it in, man. Guys was getting shot like. 15 times, you'd get shot, and you'd be like, I'm out, and they're still shooting, back, 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 back. You're like, yo, yo, I'm out, I'm out, stop shooting, and they're still going off like they're in the streets or something. Who won the match, do you remember? Um, It was different sets. Sometimes one group won, sometimes another group won, and then we switched it up, and then, so gotcha. it was a bunch of different things, but after you get shot from them times, you, you don't want to go back out. Yeah, fair Those enough. Those people So, uh, the, the match itself has, has Ghostface, Raekwon, it has Mob Deep. All these artists are signed to Loud. Is Loud somehow involved in orchestrating that event? Yeah, definitely, definitely. They put they put the whole thing together along with some of the DJs and stuff. It was a chance for us for the groups to meet some of the DJs. You know, get friendly with them, give them product and stuff like that. So it was like a it was like a meet and greet, but a different way. We wanted to do it different than just sitting down at a restaurant or whatever. So sure. we we did the whole paintball thing. Was that shit common back then? Like kind of no, uh, not sports or festivities at all? No, no. Yeah, back then, you know, they had different restaurants, meet and greets and stuff like that. That's how you got familiar with the DJs and stuff. Yeah. Let them know what new singles is coming out, what they're putting out. So 
definitely labels did big stuff. Puffy was big on that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Um, in 1999, you guys end up opening up for, for Eminem really early, like on the Slim Shady LP tour. Um, I wanted to ask how you guys ended up getting involved with, with that uh, kind of project and that tour and what your impressions was of Eminem at that period of time. Cause that would have been when he was just kind of starting to, to kind of enter mainstream conversations. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was your impressions and yeah, how well, did that end up getting orchestrated? Um, well, we always felt he was dope because we knew him before he even came out. Um, there's a the outsiders? Out Jersey called the, out the outsiders, right. Okay. They used to bring him around and he used to follow them around. They, they were doing shows and he was, they were letting him open up and, and rhyme on their shows. And we did a lot of shows with the outsiders. So we kind of got to know Shady and once he got his foot in the door and he, you know, he remembered us and, and he brought us on for a show. We did more than one show with him, but he brought us on for a show or two for him and Royce the Five Nine. Shout out Royce the Five Nine. Wow, what was your impression like of Eminem at that period of time? He was dope. He was dope from day one. He was dope from day one. We always knew that somehow or another he was gonna make it because he was shopping his demo around and he was going around New York City trying to build, you know, trying to build the hype and everything. And we all knew at, at some point he was going to get it because he, he just stood out. He always had that shock value content. Sure. Yeah, I didn't know that you guys had really that relationship cemented with, with the outsiders, but it does make sense that that's the case. Um, yeah. I think Eminem kind of fits that palette. Of course, he's a, he's a member of the outsiders at that period of time. But if you look at the other mm -hmm. artists like Young Z and um, the, like uh, Pace One and Raw Digga, like hey, there's, a, yep. there's a style there that kind of matches what what Eminem was doing at that period of time especially if you look at someone like Young Z. Definitely definitely big shout out to Young Z. He definitely influenced Eminem a lot. I know I know that for a fact so definitely. Absolutely. I want to ask about the the name change. So in the late '90s, you guys end up changing your name from from Cella Dwellers to the Dwellers for that follow up project. Uh, what was the significance of that that name change, and why did that end up happening? Um, that was just anywhere we went. People instead of just saying the long name Cella Dwellers, they'd be oh the Dwellers is here. Oh Dwellers, yo yo Dwellers, y'all ready to go on stage or whatever. So we just it was just we just dropped it. It wasn't it wasn't nothing really like a big big deal or nothing. So gotcha. And why not end up putting up a follow-up project to that yeah, last Shelby first record? Um, like, of course, I know you, you guys ended up recording some material within the last, like, 10 years or so, like, kind of modern Cellar Dwellers material. Um, mm -hmm. But it felt like after that, that second project, the last Shelby first, it felt like it but, kind of died down after that. Um, what was the, the reason for that kind of, I guess, decline um, after that, that kind of 2000 project? Um, well, the first album, we dropped the first album, and then the second album, um, Loud had got swallowed up by Sony. They switched from BMG, RCA, to Sony. And with, with the Sony transfer came a lot of other groups, like the MOPs, the Beat Nuts, a couple other groups. So we just thought that we were going to get lost in the shuffle with all of them other groups coming. Plus, we was already competing with Big Pun and Mob Deep and Dead Prez and all the other groups. So it's like, yo, it's getting crowded over here. And we're we're the most underground out of everybody. We're not gonna get the attention we deserve. Yeah. So we was gonna move over to Rocket, which would have been a better fit for us. And then Steve got the ask, idea yeah. like um he was like, don't go to Rocket. I'm I'm doing a smaller label called Stimulated. And we're going to have Dante Ross, who was an A&R for lecturer, and, you know, big yeah. shout out to Dante Ross. And then he's going to run this label, and then you guys can kind of be the Wu-Tang of the smaller branch label. So we was like, okay, we, you know, that sounds like a good idea. So we tried that with the, with the second album. And then we, when that didn't happen, then we kind of just kind of, you know, put a sour taste in our mouth, and we kind of just fell back from everything. Yeah, I was going to ask about Rockus or those kind of other, those other labels around that period of time that just fit, it kind of fit your sound and, and style anyway, because Loud, right, as you said, is expanding, it's becoming a little bit more of a commercial identity, right? Loud Records? Right. Uh, exactly. They were becoming way more, more corporate. Yeah, you know, with the Bone Thugs and all the other groups that came over in that transfer, it just yeah. made it hard for a group like us to get the full attention that, that we deserve. 
so what happens in the kind of in the 2000s then for yourself? So I know UG starts working with cats at least around like kind of the mid 2000s, late 2000s. You start having UG work with cats like uh, um, ID and Alucard and the Creative Juices movement. And big shout outs to them. I think that music's right. incredible. Um, but we don't really hear a lot of solo material from yourself during that period of yeah. time. At least not that I'm familiar right. with. What happens with right. you throughout that kind of decade? I, I just kind of fell back. I just kind of fell back and just, you know, just did my own little thing. I, I never really wanted to do the solo stuff. I was always group orientated. I could have put out, I could have put out solo stuff, but you know, when I, when I, if I want to do a project, I want to see it all the way through. I don't just see it as one thing. So I would have to have features and different producers and all that kind of stuff. And then that wasn't going to come into play with no real structure behind it, no backing or no finances. So it's like, I, I just said, you know what, let me just fall back. And whenever we do the other stuff, we'll kind of just come back and do that stuff. So I think the the first stuff that I started to hear you kind of coming back to to fold anyhow is mm -hmm. kind of early 2010, so maybe like 2011, 2012 or so. And it was always, yeah, as you said, paired with the paired with UGS as a this project. Um, but what what was the the reason to yeah to to come back at that period of time and and start recording again, start kind of diving into music because you had to expect at least at that period of time there wasn't going to be any sort of aspirations for commercial success right that wasn't the type of tip that you guys right. were on um right why come back and, and start working on music again in a little bit more of a serious fashion around that well, well, era? well we we were still doing shows we were still doing a lot of shows we just wasn't doing the actual putting out new music but we would always had a spectacular show so the shows would still come in we'll still do shows overseas we'll still go places and everywhere we went people kept asking yo when that next brother project coming out when 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 y'all putting out more music and we was like yeah we've been thinking about it we're gonna work on it and everywhere we went and then you know he did he did solo stuff i did stuff here and there with a couple people a couple features here and there sprinkle here and there yeah and no matter what we do people always ask yo when when's that next cellar dweller song when's that next cellar dweller project so we just, you know, we just kept it going. We just tried to keep it going as much as possible. And, and what's happening now? So obviously you're doing a promotional run to some degree. So you're working on new music. What's what's kind of coming out of the musical side anyways with uh, with yourself and with Cellar Dwellers over the, the next little while? Uh, we're just trying to, we're just trying to see what, what's the demand for it and, and how to get it out on these new platforms. You know, we're still from that, that, that golden era with records and CDs and vinyl and stuff like that, tapes. So we got to get into this new Spotify and iTunes and all these other digital platforms, see how that works out. So I'm still trying to work out the kinks and figure out the do's and the don'ts and why's and the why nots with that. So um, we're supposed to be working on some new music um, really soon, actually. And I'm, I'm still debating about a solo EP right now. So I got a couple songs that, that's, that's coming out pretty good. So I'm really thinking about considering it. Label-wise, do you have any direction in mind for, for where you're going to kind of um, put this project? Like, I know I, I mentioned earlier, but UG was working a lot with like Creative Juices and what they're doing right. over in that camp. And I think that's a really respectable brand. But also like Nick mm -hmm. Wiz has like the No Sleep Recordings and now has some shit on, right. um, on Dust and Dope, I believe, is putting out some of the, the Nick Wiz projects now. Um, do you have any right. projects or do you have any kind of label interest in mind for, for some of the... I haven't, I, haven't had, I, haven't had a, I haven't had a direction of where I want to go yet. My thing is the music right. will, will dictate where, where it needs to go. So I want to get the music done first and foremost get it done the way I want it, the way I see it fit, and then I'll take it around to see where, where, it should, where, where it would be the best fit for it to go. I wanted to talk about that EP that you mentioned, the, your solo EP anyways, that you're, you're thinking about putting out. Um, stylistically, mm -hmm. musically, sonically, what can we really expect from that project? Because I haven't heard anything that's solo from you before. But um, it, it's going to be dope. That's, that's all I can tell you. It, it's it's going to be dope from head to toe. Now, whether it's going to sell a bunch of records or do great or whatever, that I don't know, that I can't control. All right. I can control are, on my end, what I do in the studio. And sure. it, it's going to be definitely some dope music. I got um I got a feature with uh, Crazy Dreams from Dust Band, so that's going to be insane. Uh, I got another one from Al Scratch from 
that are now splat. That's dope. That's so that one. that's another dope song. I got I got a hook from D, got a hook from DV Elias Christ. So it's 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 coming together real nice. It's coming together real nice. Production wise, are you dabbling with some of the production on here, or is it all handled by outside producers? Um, outside producers right now. I'm definitely gonna have Mick Wiz on there. Dope. Um, UG is gonna splash me with it with a with a beat that he took up because he's cooking up some real dope shit. Uh, I got uh, Six Figure Digger who did a lot of stuff for Dipset. He did Many Men for um, Fifty Cent. Oh, wow. He did. Um, That's such a good track beat. for the Young Guns. Yeah, he got golden. Platinum. Yeah, he got golden platinum plaques all on his wall. So he he he's definitely um, contributing to the project. So it's, it's it's coming out real real dope. And then, uh, and I know again the the project's kind of in its infancy stages. You're still working on the actual product itself, and I know you probably don't have a lot of this kind of articulated and thought out. But um, do you have anything in mind in terms of physical products for the release, or are you just kind of thinking about putting it on streaming services and kind of leaving it there, or do you plan on pressing CDs, vinyls, tape for the uh, for the project? Yeah, I might I might do I might do like a hundred you know a hundred limited vinyls and then. Do the, uh, the rest of it on the digital platforms or whatever. What, whatever makes sense when it's all yes. said and done, I'll, I'll, I'll see, you know, how everybody else is kind of structuring theirs, and then I'll sure. kind of feed off of that 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 way. I think there's a demand. I think there's a demand, especially now for for physical product, but specifically of the type of sound that you're coming with. And I, I, I haven't heard the EP, I haven't heard these sessions, but but I do know your name but, and I know the brand that you, you rock with. And mm-hmm. that Cell as well as sound is is highly revered within that kind of collector community, right? That digging in the crates community, you guys end up right. making the perfect right. sound for that. Um, uh, Nick Wiz, you can't keep that shit, right? Like if Nick Wiz drops those old like classic right. archive tapes, um, they sell out instantly right oh yeah yeah it goes it, it goes it goes quick it goes they, they do you know they do 500 600 limited copies all that stuff flies off the shelf so i, I should be right in i should be able to do right in that realm you know what i mean I'd hope so. I'd hope so. I, I think so, at least myself. Like, as myself, someone that collects physical media, um, I have the records mm-hmm. over there, my tapes underneath. Um, th- that's the type of shit that I buy. And the people right. that I kind of, uh, in my circle anyhow, it's the same type of shit, right? Um, I'd yeah. love to see something physical from, uh, from a solo project of yours. And more than oh, anything, no. Trust me when I tell you, the, the people that I'm reaching out to, the collaborations that I'm getting and I'm making, it, it's 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 gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. Yeah, more than if you anything. Like real hip hop, you're gonna like it. Yeah, more than anything, I'm just excited to to hear new material from yourself. Like I said, I haven't heard a solo project from you before, and mm-hmm. everything that you've you've ever done in your career, I think, really kind of holds up to that standard of quality that I end up uh, seeking out anyhow. Um, and the sound is is always something yeah. that I dig. So I, uh, I I'm a fan of of yourself, anyways, and I'm excited to see what kind of new projects you are you end up coming out with thank you thank you i'll, de- I'll definitely send you send you send you um the, fir- the first draft of everything once it's once it's mixed and mastered and all said and done i'd love to be able to hear it man where where can people find you where can people stay up to date with current music that's coming out uh, and just your name in general yeah um phantasm seller dweller i'm on facebook and instagram uh, I don't do the Twitter and all the other stuff. So Facebook, Instagram, Phantasm Seller Dweller, it'll definitely pop up. Perfect. Again, man, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to speak to me here. I appreciate it. And yeah, I can't yep. thank you enough. I'd love to have you back on in the future yep. whenever you have new projects coming out. Definitely. As soon as we get a single or something something together, I'll definitely let you know. We set something up and I'll shoot you the music first so you can have the exclusive. Oh, man, I love it. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, we'll definitely have you back on at some point in the future. Definitely. Salute. I got the mind is touch. Everything I hold a touch can bust the gold dust. You see me as a threat, but you don't need to sweat Cause your girl know I keep her wetter than a Chia pet See you on the grind, you on the grind Ain't nobody give a fuck when you doing bad Motherfuckers wanna hate when you doing good 
hoping that this feeling doesn't stay Getting drunk every day, waiting till it goes the fuck away Then I wake up to another day just to face reality again Cause the buzz of pain doesn't change a fucking thing Nothing comes next, I wonder what's next I used to be atheist, but now I just say fuck it, I'm blessed Fuck it, I'm blessed They say it's easier said than done So I'm working till I get it done uh.